Good morning, church. Please join me in this call to worship. Come, give thanks to the Lord with all your heart and soul. We come rejoicing over God's many blessings poured out on us. God's works are great. We delight in learning about them. Respect for God and all that God offers to us is the beginning of wisdom. With gratefulness, we shall praise and honor God all our lives. Amen. Christ for the world we sing. The world to Christ we bring with loving zeal. The poor in them that mourn, the faint and overborn, sin sick and sorrow worn for Christ.
From the dust we came To the dust we shall return From the dust we came To the dust we shall return God everlasting Age unto age the same We are a moment Then like a breath we fade From the dust we came To the dust we shall return From the dust we came To the dust we shall return God everlasting We are cut down as grass Seeds in the morning And by the night we pass mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shake your chains to the earth And rise up with the dawn Whoa, whoa, my soul My soul Each step A living prayer And we never walk alone No, we don't Oh,
rise up with the dawn Oh, oh, my soul Oh, my soul All are welcome at the table of God. Every human is God's child. For Christ brings peace to all. Tearing down every hostile wall. So that the many may become one. One heart. One family. One new humanity. 
for God, who is love. And Christ, who is all and in all. Show no partiality and make no distinction. So neither race nor class. Gender nor sexuality. Politics nor religion. Personality nor nationality. Count for us or against us. The light of Christ enlightens all. Christ the prisoner and the naked. Christ the hungry and the sick. Christ the thirsty and the stranger. Christ the other. May God's spirit hover over our chaos. Our hatred and our indifference. Descend in our hearts with love and pleasure. Blow us out into the world to listen and to serve. And set us ablaze to forgive and reconcile. For all are welcome at the table of God. Every human is God's child. Hi, I'm Susan from Kennebunkport, Maine. Please join us in our generosity prayer. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts fixing our hope on God and not on the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds, willing to share all that we have and laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but we will shine in the age to come. May this be true of our community. Amen. At this time, we invite you to share the gift of your blessing by simply saying peace and grace to those with those who are watching with you now or by texting or calling a loved one. Grace and peace to you. Very good. What did we say? I'm going to start with a question to you. How did we get to here? Should we welcome each other or is that too corny? So far, it's really corny. Okay. Yeah. So how did we get to New York? How did we get to New York, Megan? This is New York 2.0 for us. Mm -hmm. We um, lived here in our 20s and moved away, different places, raised our family and decided to come back when our nest emptied, which it did. And we have been here for just under two years, and we love it. 
we have jobs here, we're working, we are in a different stage of life, and it's been a really great transition back to the city, for sure. And we were debating and deciding what to do about church, and... Yeah, yeah and we've been, we've been uh, engaged in churches uh, all of our adult lives. Megan, you've been engaged at church your entire life. Adult I life. engaged my, started going to church once you and I uh, started dating. But in Los Angeles, we, we had deep roots in a church. Uh, in the Atlanta years, we had deep roots in our church. And when we were moving to, getting ready to move to New York, we started asking around, uh, what did people know? And we had a pastor in an Atlanta church who was a good friend of ours, a great friend, still a great friend of ours, who recommended Good Shepherd and spoke highly of the music and of Michael's preaching. Mm -hmm. And so we came and we made a list of churches, correct? I mean, I think it was a short list, but we had ideas. Even when we were here yeah. many moons ago, we worshiped at a yeah. large, well-known yeah. Presbyterian church that was here, and so that was kind of on our radar too. So we did, we did Good Shepherd first on the first Sunday, and then where did we go on the second Sunday? Good Shepherd. <laughs> so <laughs> the list is still unchecked. We, yeah. We checked Good Shepherd and that's been the... And we uh, just stayed. That's where we've been, yeah. yeah it's been a really, really good... Um, I don't want to say the word fit because I don't think that church is like supposed to, um, you know, meet our needs completely, but it is a space mm -hmm. that I think we felt really comfortable in and welcomed in mm -hmm. and also nice to be visitors and not yeah. be deeply embedded in a church experience and just come to experience the worship and test those waters a little bit. And what we, I mean, at least for me, what I appreciated right away was the, the depth of the theology and the preaching, but also, and it sounds contradictory, the simplicity of the service, mm -hmm. which means to me, it just stays with really consistent liturgical practices mm -hmm. and they're really beautiful and they are um, approached in a very humble and thoughtful way, but always excellent and always thought provoking. Long, long ago, a uh, pastor at a church we were in in LA had one of those pastor offhanded comments during a sermon and said, home is not where you're from, it's where you're going. And that ha has always resonated with me. And one of the things about this church, Good Shepherd, that I really see in the life of the church and the, the sermons that are coming out is that Jesus and the teaching is completely alive. That's a, a good point, because what I reflect on a lot when I think about Good Shepherd and what um, Michael is very consistent with in his his preaching and his homilies is just the gospel, is mm -hmm. the life of Jesus and how did Jesus live and what does that mean for us? Yeah. And and that's, that's almost it. And mm -hmm. I just really am so grateful to be in an, a church space that sticks to that and speaks about Jesus that it, in a way that truly exemplifies how radical he is, mm -hmm. where I think, you know, churches tend to shy away from that now or don't really want to admit that for some reason. Yeah. But the reality is, is he was a radical type of leader. And mm -hmm. I think that we can all be reminded of that every day because we live in a world that needs that kind of compassion and open mindedness and I it's just occurred to me at this stage in our lives and having a lot of church history definitely behind me a lifetime of it realizing how much I wanted that and needed that and didn't know that I wasn't really getting that kind of um, being fed in that way when I just think oh, someone is finally saying someone is finally saying what I've been trying to articulate in a church experience. Mm -hmm. And that's been really exciting. And so um, that has made it unique for me and special and just really, um, just really beautiful. It's just a beautiful service. I mean, for, we all know that it's really beautiful. Yeah. As we began to engage the church, so the services are wonderful. There's a diverse age group of parishioners. Mm -hmm. Uh, of participants. 
Well, we were curious. So we were thought, okay, let's learn more about it as well. I mean, yeah. I tend to like to know um, what a church's position is on things and sort of what their mission is and their, their pillars as Good Shepherds. So we did go to a few of those yeah. early on when they were, um, when Michael was hosting them on some consecutive weeks. And that was a good experience. Um, and then we answered sort of a, an ask about starting a small group in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there wasn't one. We are in the the Hudson Square Tribeca area and that's a small group that we decided to start and open up and that was sort of a you know I guess a leap of faith I mean yeah. you know you don't know who's gonna show up we did learn that uh, so this is our second uh, big move in about a decade mm -hmm. and the advice we got on the first one was say yes lean into that's things true. And so that's been so yeah you said said been. yes and people signed up and um, yeah, that's been our, it's that's been really, really enjoyable. It's been so wonderful. Really I mean, it just kind of keeps evolving and growing and, you know, different ages and stages in this group. Um, I have been, we have been really supported by Alicia and, and just the, the pastoral staff there. And, and they've been very thoughtful um, groups and experiences. Mm -hmm. So that, that has been really nice. And it does narrow down the community focus and helps kind of hone in a little bit on a, in, a, in a more personal way with people. And then suddenly you start showing up on Sundays and you know people and yeah. that's kind of how it goes. Yeah, it's, yeah that part's been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And what I've always thought about it is it is the exact kind of church that I would want to bring someone to who absolutely had no interest in church. And I would say, no, but this one, like you're gonna just appreciate the beauty of it. You know, if you, you have any sense of appreciating arts and music and um, you know, any yeah, kind of sure. spiritual structure, like it's all in there. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that has been a, it's such a welcoming place. Yeah. And people have said this before, that it's a really safe place. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've noticed that it's not um, what we were yeah. seeking or like needing in that space, yeah. but it's so, um, it's been pretty profound to be yeah. in a worship space that feels We feel really excited to be able, there are so many people out there asking all the time, is can I get into an ecumenical, non-denominational experience? I mean, those are words that people put together. Right, and we're like, you can, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's Chelsea there. Chelsea, all mm -hmm. the time. <laughs> it exists. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, that's been, a, it, it's been nice to feel like people are coming into this worship experience who um, need healing. That's mm -hmm. been a new experience yeah. as well, at least for me, of, you know, this term uh, church trauma and re recognizing like all the paths that we bring and that have mm -hmm. brought us into different places in life and that we can land there and um, find a place that that is compassionate and yeah. welcoming for people. And I think that that's been exactly what the gospel requires of us actually. And so that's that's what's been so meaningful to me is to say, oh, this is the ethos of scripture and we are in a space that somehow consistently week after week is reminds us of that yeah. in, a, in a really great way, so. That comfort of the church uh, to be at a church where we are not the focus demographic and this church is, uh, leads with its heart and really communicates. We are open. We are an open church, and and that message is uh, that message is open in particular, uh, and and yet I feel completely a part of it and want mm -hmm. to do everything we can to support this church. And when our children are here visiting, um, you know, we've brought them to worship. We've done Christmas Eve, and you know, our. our young adult son looked at us after Christmas Eve and said that was the best church service I've ever been to. Mm -hmm. And he's been to a lot in his life, you know, he grew up in all of that. So um, it, it hits on a lot of levels for lots of different kinds of people and different places in their life, which I think is important too, for sure. And we've made some really good friends in our small group and that's yeah. been really sweet. It's a nice thing to be able to do that and break bread and um, have that time together with each other. Yeah, I feel like Michael has said in our early time, the, 
The span of uh, New Yorkers is three to five years. Uh, and I, I don't know how long we'll be here, but uh, that accelerated uh, breaking down the groups into smaller groups uh, fairly quickly means in the course of a year, a course of 18 months, some deep friendships can form. What I want to say is this has been a really um, f very special, I think, for the two of us to find this together because while we do have a shared history of faith, it's actually pretty um, unique in how we found each other and that has been something that's evolved in our relationship. So I grew up in the church. I was born into practically like generations of the Presbyterian church and all my life was doing that. In fact, went to a Christian school for most of my middle school, high school, and some of my elementary years. And it just was never not a part of my life. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel forced. It felt very in welcoming and like, it's very Presbyterian. And mm -hmm. But it was meaningful. Like my dad is a, an academic and theologian in the field. And so I felt like I had a very learned kind of like environment with that and grew up with it. And then we met, and you did not have that experience. No, I did not. So I grew up in uh, San Luis Obispo, California, a uh, wonderful town. Uh, but you go west, young man, uh, to reinvent yourself uh, in the American ethos. And so we were a wonderful family, loved my nuclear family, but church was not part of our, our daily life. So by the time you and I met, late, late into college, I had been to two Christmas services maybe my entire my entire life. And then we started to engage it uh, when we lived here as younger, but then as we were starting to get a family together, we, uh, we found a church and it made a ton of sense. And so I would have told you that in that experience, what you were explaining, we entered this church and I, for reasons that it made sense, uh, I'm trying to think like, uh, for not necessarily societal norms, because I was going to say that, but the, um, the, the comfort of our family and the direction we were going, mm -hmm. it made sense for us to join and move forward with. But I'll use that uh, C.S. Lewis experience, I think, in his book where he says as a, in a, that he had a sidecar ride, ride in, in a motorcycle, and when they started the ride, he didn't believe in God, and then when they finished the ride, he did believe in God, so it just happened somewhere in between, and I feel like that in our journey. Mm -hmm. So then we moved to Atlanta, but then coming to New York was, we were searching for a church for our home, mm -hmm. which was a very exciting. Uh, and you know, change. we had different needs, right? So we didn't have kids. It wasn't, you know, when you're starting out and you have young children, you're looking for a family environment at a church, and, we're, and we found one, and it was amazing and wonderful. But even that started to pivot away when we relocated yeah. to, to Atlanta. Um, they became a little less interested and we, you know, kind of had to navigate that yeah. differently. And then here, it really just did what's out there. There are mm -hmm. exciting ministries happening everywhere. Yeah. What are some really interesting different ones? And this was, like you said, was the one that was introduced to us. And that's the one, you know, it's the kind of thing you don't really know that's what you were looking for until you find it and say, that's that's exactly what I was hoping for, I think, now that I know. Do you think there's any church pulpit in the world where the, ser or the, the service ends and uh, don't forget to pick up your kids, nails it, knocks it out? Every time it works. It works every time and nobody forgets their kids. No, they never they do. They never do. <laughs> they never do. You know, thinking about the next year for Good Shepherd, mm -hmm. it's exciting it's um, unsettling potentially you know and for some worshipers um, but it's so rooted and I can already sense that this next kind of um, encouragement campaign for lack of a better word um, the journey of, of this next season for Good Shepherd is so rooted in faith and humility and thoughtfulness and what that makes me think of is how trustworthy it is as an institution. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that, to realize like I, I trust what's happening. Yeah. I trust the leadership. I trust what's coming out of um, the worship experience and what's being shared. And that's been um, so far. Yeah, you know, that's a great point. It's, 
it's exciting to me to think about it. Yeah, they've established uh, trust and that the leadership, there's, there's a big change coming and they've done a very good job of being transparent, but then they, you know that they have more decisions behind the scenes that they need. They would be derelict in their duty if they weren't uh, mm -hmm. taking care of those. And uh, the information that comes out is fair and transparent and what cards they are holding close, uh, there's no problem honoring that. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't really bring us to a conclusion of this. Um, so, so yeah. We're, I'm excited for the. I'm excited for what's next. I am excited. Instead of feeling like, okay, something's happening, I'm out. Yeah. I feel like mm, something's happening, and I'm in. I'm yeah. in with that. And yeah, I'm I mean, we've been here less that. than two years. This church is about to go through a major change, and I'm much more likely to lean in and mm -hmm. dig in deeper. Good morning once again, welcome to Good Shepherd New York. My name is Michael Rizzina and I'm one of the pastors here. Today our reading is from the Gospel according to St. John chapter 2. This is the story of the cleansing of the temple. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found people selling cattle and sheep, doves and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and he overturned their tables. To those who sold the doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, before I offer my reflection on this gospel story on this third Sunday of Lent, I'd like to invite you into a moment of quiet that we share as a sacred moment of openness and of attention. We, in the words of Mary Oliver, realize that attention is the beginning of devotion. And so we open our hearts to the possibility that this story could connect to our story in a way that's meaningful. Would you join me in a moment of quiet? God, we pray for your wisdom. We pray for genuine inspiration. We pray that this story would speak freshly and that it would live through us this week. We pray that in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, this is a, a fascinating story for the third Sunday of Lent. Lent is a season where we follow Jesus to Jerusalem and we specifically focus on the conflicts that Jesus has which build to the point of his crucifixion. And I think we're meant to ask, partly in Lent, why is Jesus so controversial? Why is Jesus someone who the masses and certainly the political and religious leaders would want to see crucified? What is it that Jesus is upsetting? What is it that Jesus is challenging? And more than that, what is Jesus protecting and defending? What is that thing that he's holding out as precious and beautiful that needs protecting. I wonder with this story how Jesus' contemporaries would have viewed him and would have interpreted this moment. And there certainly was the money factor. Right? You had Roman denarii and attic drachmas which bore pagan and imperial portraits. They were seen as unacceptable for paying the temple tax. You see this in Matthew 17 verse 27. 
And the money changers, well, they performed a necessary task of convert, converting that pagan currency into the acceptable coins of Tyre. And so this acceptable function uh, that started out as a good idea, it started out as uh, an, an ability to enable people and empower people to maintain their sense of holiness and honor in this place of reverence. In, in essence, uh, to help them avoid idolatry and to worship the living God. Well, this practice instead began to feed idolatry itself. And it did this through ex extortion and corrupt practices where, uh, of course, like we all know, when we go to uh, the sports stadiums and we go to the theme parks, the prices are jacked up significantly. And that's because they can. Right? We are hostage in this space of entertainment and with no other place to turn, we have to pay what we have to pay, whether that's $22 for a Bud Light or it's $18 for a slice of pizza. And this had become a similar kind of circumstance. And it was particularly difficult for the poor. Those who would stand in line for the doves, who couldn't afford the larger and uh, more robust animals. And here, these poor pilgrims were being picked on, they were being exploited, and there was a kind of economic strength that was being built through this system for a few. Jesus also recognizes the animal factor. And in addition to the money factor, the animals, of course, were necessary for temple sacrifice. But it seems that the danger of an escaped animal running through the temple courts and perhaps entering into the Holy of Holies by accident was a risk that was originally avoided by keeping the animals outside of the temple precincts. It was likely Caiaphas in the time of Jesus who introduced them into the temple pre precincts. And all of this likely under the guise of convenience. And so again, some good idea that originally had a sort of intrinsic good to it becomes corrupted. And Jesus sees the chaos of this moment, the chaos of the money and the animals and the way that it is essentially throwing into relief the original pur purpose of the temple. And he begins to perform a prophetic symbolic action. I think that if you interpret Jesus as a lot of the people in this moment would have interpreted him as standing up against these practices, as naming them as corrupt, as essentially challenging this system within the system that was preying upon the weak and the poor. Jesus confronts it by turning over the tables and by driving out the animals. Jesus was viewed as performing prophetic symbolic action in the vein of Jeremiah or Ezekiel. And this kind of action was set in motion with the judgment spoken by the prophet, quote, stop making the house of my father a house of marketing, end quote. Matthew's story has Jesus saying, quote, it is written, my temple shall be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of robbers. Now it seems that humans don't really know, we don't really know, how to make a group feel special and how to make it feel holy without making it exclusive or without entering into behaviors, predatory behaviors that create that sense of exclusivity. We take good things and we make them ultimate things. Or we take the good things and we use them to our advantage to bolster our strength or bolster our status. When things become too important for uh, our sense of identity, again, or our sense of meaning, or our sense of security, people always suffer. And Jesus confronts this over and over again in the gospel stories. Whether it's the Sabbath, where Jesus enters into a situation where the Sabbath as a, a, a vision, as a practice, as a code, is being weaponized against certain kinds of people, people who are sick, weaponized against people who are often uh, poor, weaponized against people who 
had a hard time keeping that law because of their economic situation. And Jesus, in a moment where his disciples are picking grain uh, in the fields and are caught, uh, Jesus, in the aftermath of being confronted for healing on the Sabbath, actually doing good on this day of rest and of worship, he says, you know, the Sabbath was made for humanity, not the humanity for the Sabbath. Whether it's purity codes that were social in nature, things like food and touch, where Jesus would subvert them and say the whole point of this was to cultivate a sense of awe and reverence and a sense of love for God and for our neighbor. Instead, it's been weaponized. And now our tables where we share food have been exclusive to Gentiles and to others. And those that we touch uh, are, uh, and, and that we have interaction with uh, are qualified and have to meet a certain kind of status. And people are excluded. And here it's the temple. Jesus is subverting this idea of the temple as a place uh, to create gain or to create advantage. He's rebuking this idea of the temple as a place of, of uh, superiority or of status. In each case, something that was designed to help people become truly holy, become truly connected to divine love, become truly able to fulfill the human calling of love has been twisted and corrupted in some way. These are adventures in missing the point. Now, what is the point that Jesus is trying to drive home in today's story? Well, I think it's that temples and the protocols around the temple are only holy in as much as they facilitate love for God and love for neighbor. When they become something else, a badge of power perhaps, or a symbol of strength or superiority, or if they become a system of exploitation or feed a system of exploitation, well, then they become not only falling short, something that falls short of the good for which they were designed, but they become rather a powerful force for evil in the world. And Jesus knew the utter horror of people doing terrible things and then thinking that God was on their side. And so he sought to set us free both as victims of this human inclination and also as perpetrators of it. Now, he turns over tables in this story and he drives out the animals in what most consider a moment of rage. And Jesus, Jesus makes it extremely clear that this is wrong. The leaders, however, they respond not from a place of receptivity or curiosity, they don't respond like the uh, centurion who beats his breast and says, have mercy on me, O God, a sinner. Instead, they respond from that place of ego. They respond from the bruised side of the cheek, not turning the other cheek to the place of, of uh, I'm sorry, they, they respond from the strong part of the cheek, not from the vulnerable bruised part. And instead they say uh, what we all say and do what we all do. They become defensive. They begin to deflect. And rather than asking what this moment means and what, he, he's trying, what point he's trying to make, it, rather it seems pretty clear the point he's trying to make, they instead ask, by what authority are you doing this? What do you think or who do you think you are? And this is where Jesus says, if you destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. Now, the evangelist John gives us an interpretation here. And he says to us that Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. And this is a, a baffling interpretation, frankly, for the Mediterranean cultural perspective. In that time and in that place, they cherished the group orientation and they cherished commitment to the group, loyalty to the group. Any emphasis on the individual like this is practically non-existent in that time because it would have been perceived to weaken or to destroy the coherence of the group, the strength of the group. But Jesus is helping them see that what really matters to God is the human being. What really matters to God is learning how to love. And that when we 
lose sight of the value of human beings for some kind of strength or power or advantage that we gain from a system or a thing that God's created rather than a person, then a corruption is taking place, right? It's not the day you rest. It's that you rest. It's not the food you put in your body or the people that you touch. It's about the evil that comes from the heart, as Jesus said. And it's about the people that you avoid that matters. And here with the temple, it's not brick and mortar. It's not stone. We can think of our own holy places like this beautiful chapel. It's not the mosaic tile on the ground or the same stained glass all around that makes you holy or that makes you special. It's God's presence and God's love that makes us special. I have to confess that one of the genius aspects of Jesus' teaching is that he establishes a new baseline for holiness. Right? It's radically inclusive in practice while simultaneously calling out and pushing back on the corrupt exclusivity that's rooted in human pride and the need to sort of feel important or maintain control. Jesus knows this is not compatible with love. I have to say that on this third Sunday of Lent, where we are three weeks removed now from uh, getting news that uh, this chapel and our church's arrangement with General Theological Seminary uh, is going to be terminated. I find great hope, I find great joy, and I find great confidence in this story and in this teaching. The fact that Jesus would recenter in every one of these moments, whether it's Sabbath or it's the table practice or it's who you're touching or it's who you're affiliating with socially or it's what's happening in a sacred space like the temple, the fact that Jesus would constantly reorient us the way that we lean on these things and make them something that hurts people or exploits people or becomes too close to our identity that we lose sight and we lose track of what really matters. The fact that Jesus does it then makes me think that it's the kind of thing that Jesus is doing and emphasizing now, today, with me and with our community and with people all over the world of goodwill and good faith. Jesus is always trying to help us see, to turn the diamond of our experience, to see the shine and the glimmer of what is truly valuable. And that is the love of God and our connection with that love and the way we share that connection with one another. Now, in as much as a place like this can foster that and facilitate that, it's beautiful. But when a place like this becomes too important, or it becomes something that becomes exploitative, or it becomes something uh, that we can't live without, well, now it's an adventure in missing the point. And so I really appreciate this emphasis on this day, and I take comfort that Jesus makes that identification of the temple with his body, with his being. And you and I were called to do the same thing. One of the most powerful things about the, the community that bore Jesus' name was the way that they imagined themselves. No longer did they look to sacred architecture as the basis and the foundation of their holiness or the basis and the foundation of their identity. Instead, they eventually moved out and away from the temple, especially after it was destroyed. And they moved into spaces that were like homes. Uh, they had meals around a table, a common table, it's where they practice uh, these meals called agape meals, and its climax or crescendo was with the Eucharist. And it wasn't until uh, later that basilicas became, uh, that came to be constructed and uh, the houses of worship uh, began to, begun, uh, to be built. And I don't demonize that, but it's important to understand our origins. And just as Jesus didn't demonize the temple, he didn't demonize the Sabbath, he just said, you've missed the point. I think he would say the same thing to us today in the face of anxiety, in the face of fear, in the face of panic, in the face of not knowing what uh, or who we will be without this specific space. And yet we're reminded by Jesus that the house of God is meant to be an instrument or a facilitator of prayer. It's not meant 
to be a place of exclusivity. It's not meant to be a place of superiority or stability. It's meant to be a place that facilitates connection with God. And so today, on this third Sunday of Lent, we're invited to take up this prophetic stance, this against-the-grain imagination, and we're called to reimagine what it means to be the people of God. Uh, On this third Sunday of Lent, we're inviting you, as we've been inviting you, into prayer. And we're continuing to share stories from our community so that we can recenter in the spirit of Jesus' teaching here. What matters most? The people. We are the the, the place where God dwells. We are the, the, the location where God's love is experienced and shared. We are the people uh, who create conditions through uh, our own postures and attitudes and practices uh, that are conducive to prayer. And this third Sunday of Lent, uh, we invite you to invest financially in the future of this community. Uh, And we do it to remember that this place, and right now even the banging that you hear, is the banging of a radiator. It sounds literally like someone's slamming a wrench up against a bar, but it's just simply a radiator. And it's a fine example of how buildings can actually cut against the grain of what you're trying to do. But at any rate, uh, we're going to be inviting you this week, beginning this week, to invest in uh, the uh, financial capacity of our community, to be able to pivot into our future uh, with a sense, as Eshan, one of our trustees, said, with a sense of swiftness and a sense of smoothness. Um, It's already a pretty stressful moment uh, for, especially for those of us who are having to move uh, our homes and find new apartments, and for those of us who are also helping lead this congregation and looking for new venues. uh, We really do want to try to smooth the road as well as possible. So we're going to be setting a capital goal during the season of Lent and Easter and beyond um, of $300,000. And we're doing this uh, to, again, build the capacity that we need. Um, There are several possible roads ahead. Uh, We're going to be sharing updates as soon as we have them more concretely. But as we pursue the paths that we've we've laid out and we've projected based on them, uh, we know that we're going to have to have additional capacity, not only for the moving and transition expenses, uh, but also for the potential of securing a lease, uh, a long-term lease, in another venue. And so with that, uh, we invite you to, to, to participate. Now, I have to say, I know that we uh, just did a big push for funding digital church. And uh, it, it's actually very uh, difficult for me to ask for these kinds of things um, because I know that money and campaigns and things like that are often the source of people's trauma. It's one of the reasons, if you're part of a New York congregation, we just almost never talk about it. We have our generosity prayer every week, uh, but we're not passing a plate. Uh, We're not putting a big push to give towards something, especially toward our community. If we ever push, it's always toward something else. And for me, that's what digital church has felt like, Uh, a ministry that we believe in and calling you to that. Um, And yet, uh, here we are facing a real need. And so, of course, we're calling on our New York uh, community uh, to to commit to this. And many of you uh, watching today uh, are a part of our New York community here. Um, but if you are beyond New York and uh, you have appreciated the sort of how the strength and the base of this community here has been able to extend uh, this ministry uh, to those who live beyond New York, uh, we invite you to invest in this as well if you're able. Um, of course, there's no shame uh, if, for instance, you gave something and it was uh, all you had to give for the year. Um, there's no shame at all. Um, but if you have capacity, and you want to help strengthen us in this time of transition, we invite you to do so. Um, We're going to be starting a fund called the My My Good Shepherd Fund. Uh, The funds for this will go exclusively to uh, the transition costs and needs associated with this transition, and uh, it is a very important thing for us. Um, I do want to tell a little bit of a story uh, before I talk about the second goal of this uh, financial invitation. Um, This week, we got a letter, and it was a precious letter. Uh, It made me tear up, and uh, I shared it with uh, our leaders. Uh, It was a letter that basically said, hey, listen, I heard about what's going on in your church, and I've just come to the end of the month. I've paid all my bills. I've paid uh, the pressing financial concerns for my family, and I have a little bit left over. 
I could use this to go eat at a restaurant or to gift myself in some way, but I'm going to choose to give it to the church, to Good Shepherd, the church that has become a huge blessing in my life and has been meaningful in discipling and having a sort of uh, sending an invitational force among people so widely and so vastly. And so uh, they enclosed a check of a hundred dollars, uh, giving from that place of joy and cheerfulness. Uh, and it, to me, it was one of those things of, uh, like Jesus had, the, the moment in the temple where he saw the widow put the mite into the, uh, the temple coffer and he marveled. And he essentially said, uh, this woman gave from her poverty and everyone else is giving from their position of wealth. And he said, essentially said, I marvel at that. Now, of course, this person's not living in poverty and yet they make a real sacrifice in making this gift and that sacrifice moves me. And it should be, a, I think, a, a, a symbol of, of gravity, of what the power of generosity is and what it means and how we can know the joy of giving sacrificially as, lo- as well. I mean, I was truly inspired myself. And so I want to encourage you uh, to think in those terms and to use your imagination and to remember the whole point of this community and of this operation is to foster that kind of faith, that kind of love, that kind of generosity. The second goal that we have is not just a, a capital goal that's for this uh, imminent transition, but also uh, our monthly uh, subscriber goal, um, those who give on a, on a planned or regular basis. We've been calling this our builder community, and this is a time for us to transition that into our My Good Shepherd community. The reason that we're doing that is because the builder name came from a previous transition that we had several years back in 2018 when uh, our family of churches that we were a part of decentralized, and again, we needed to bolster the financial strength of our community, and you showed up. Those of you who are part of our community then uh, helped us meet a capital goal, helped us strengthen our monthly giving, and it helped us enter into that next season of transition with strength. And we're hoping to do the same thing. Uh, We are in a good position with our operating budget. We have enough working capital for it. Uh, We have strong support on a monthly basis. But with a pivot like this and with a potential increase, though maybe the 300,000 can help us get into this space, it's likely that some of our costs will be uh, going up year over year. And so the monthly giving uh, that essentially gives us visibility through the year to be able to see month by month what we can count on um, is so important. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, the participation doesn't reflect uh, our attendance here in person and those who view online, not even close. I think we have around 200 total uh, people who participate in this My Good Shepherd community. Um, Why are we calling it My Good Shepherd? Well, that's the uh, name of this emphasis. And in some ways it represents a taking of ownership, a, a saying like, I'm taking responsibility Uh, financially for the community that I enjoy and that I'm blessed by and I'm investing in it. Um, So what we notice is there's about 200 people who are in this community and the average gift uh, is around $200. Now that's amazing and yet uh, we have well over 200 people showing up on Sunday morning. We have you know close to a thousand people uh, every week watching on uh, YouTube And um, I think what we're aiming for in this is just participation. Now, I know that some of you have already set up recurring gifts. Some of you have uh, set those up, you know, for our tithes and offerings. Some of you have set those up for digital church uh, funding through the rest of the year. And that's beautiful. Uh, We we consider you part of that My Good Shepherd community. Um, But what we're inviting you to is if you haven't done that or if you haven't set that up and you call Good Shepherd your home and you're blessed by it, um, we invite you to participate again. It could be $5, it could be the average gift, $200, or it could be much more based on your capacity. And for those of you who are already giving, um, our usual ask here is that you would consider and pray about increasing your gift in some way. If we could move from 200 to 250, and we could move to the average gift from 200 to 300, that would increase our uh, stability uh, significantly. And so uh, we're we're inviting you to participate in these two goals. Uh, One, above and beyond sort of the the operating budget, a $300,000 capital goal, 
and two, uh, participating in or increasing your gift in the My Good Shepherd community. So as we come to the close of this uh, Lenten uh, invitation, uh, the description of it, I would just ask you to prayerfully consider what you can do. Um, and to retain the spirit of Jesus in this story, in our gospel story. That is essentially God's presence, God's house, is, a play, is the people, and it's Jesus himself. And that we can center ourselves in that in a moment of transition as we build our strength. And we do this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now that we've considered our gospel, we take a moment to declare our faith. This is the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now that we've declared our faith, we offer our prayers. And these are the prayers of the people. And now will you join me in the prayers of the people? We pray for a broken world. We pray through our feelings of hopelessness and cynicism to a place of possibility. We pray that the eyes of the confused, the eyes of the deceived, the eyes of the angry and aggrieved be miraculously opened, that their hearts be softened. We pray for a collective recognition that whatever the question, love is the answer. We pray for those who grieve, whose hearts are heavy with mourning. We pray for those who are sick, those who are slipping away. We pray your peace would envelop them. We pray, dear Lord, for the comfort of your presence, real and unmistakable, the assurance of your love in this world and the next. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our leaders. We pray for leaders of churches and schools, of families, of companies, of nations, of movements. We pray whatever power or influence we have, wherever we have it, that we would exercise it with humility and wisdom, kindness and tenderness, with generous heapings of love and grace. Lord, give us courage to lead and humility to follow and wisdom to know which is the path you have chosen for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the spirit of truth, your spirit, to make itself known in our world and in our midst and in our innermost places. Help us to desire truth without fear, to look to you to find it, to make our demands for integrity and justice as pressing within ourselves as they are for the outside world. We pray for bravery in seeing where we fall short and where we can be better, with confidence in your love, acceptance, and forgiveness. We thank you for being a God whose mercies never fail, but are new every morning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now having prayed our prayers, we make space for confession. Would you join me in holy memory, considering the week behind us, the ways that we've fallen short of love, and ask for God's help to hone in on a memory that matters. And remember, it's God's kindness that leads to change. So if there's any image of God right now that keeps you from soberly looking at your life, simply discard it with every exhale. And with every inhale, receive afresh the tender mercy of Jesus Christ. Friends, know that you're not alone. Whatever memory is coming to the surface of your mind right now, they come to all of us. And so right now, I invite you into this ancient and corporate confession. Would you join me in this? Most merciful God, we confess that we've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
We're truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we would delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now, friends, hear the good news, that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love toward you, and as far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. You're loved and you're included and you're forgiven in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we come to this table. Again, this table which tells us there is no distinction, that there is neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile, Republican or Democrat, gay or straight, black or white, all the distinctions that we create. Jesus obliterates through his mercy and love and inclusion. And so we come to this table and we ask God to grace us once again. And we begin with gratitude. So would you join me in this ancient prayer? The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. God, it is good and beautiful to say thank you. And right now, we hear our own hearts and voices lifting up with the angels and archangels of Isaiah's vision, who say, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and cup and he blessed them. After he took the bread, he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we welcome you risen Christ. We thank you for this body, which is broken and given. May we be broken and given for our world. Likewise, Jesus took the cup, and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance, remembrance of me. And so we welcome you, risen Christ. We thank you for this cup, which points us to the way of forgiveness and reconciliation and truth. Amen. And now, friends, we declare the mystery of faith. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And these are God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God. Amen. And now, friends, we invite you to receive Holy Communion. Our practice is an open table. Any drawn to the love we see in Christ are welcome to come. Let this be a gesture of your open heart to receive the love that you find there. And our practice is typically to take the bread and dip it in the cup. Let us receive Holy Communion together. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us once again on this third Sunday of Lent. Uh, for tuning in. Uh, we do invite you to like and subscribe as it helps push this content to people who would find it meaningful. And, um, and we also want to uh, continue to hold this uh, Lenten invitation out to you. We invite you to pray. We invite you to share your story. And we invite you to contribute financially to the strength of our congregation and our community as we face transition. You can do this uh, by going on our Instagram um, profile and finding the Lenten guide and invitation prompts. Uh, you can do this by checking out the stories on Instagram or on YouTube. Uh, you can also do this by going to our website, clicking on the give button and seeing the many ways that you can give. If you designate it toward the My Good Shepherd uh, fund, you'll know that all of your, your money will go directly to helping us meet the, the challenges of this transition uh, of venue. And so uh, we, we humbly continue to invite you as we seek God in prayer and seek to become more generous ourselves. So with that, we invite you to receive this benediction. Now receive this benediction. To live as God's people of abundance while not giving in to the pull of our culture you're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Lift your hands and hearts in the name of the Father who sustains us and the Son who instructs us and the Spirit who leads us. Go forth to love and serve the Lord, the one who loves the widow and the orphan. Sing the Lord's song of hope in dry lands. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God above, ye heavenly host. Praise Mother, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go in peace. you'll never understand I'll never beat you I'll never lie and if you're evil I'll forgive you by and by cause you I would die for you darling if you want me to you I would die for you I'm not your lover I'm not your friend I am something that you'll never comprehend No need to worry, no need to cry I'm your Messiah and you're the reason why you, I would die for you Darling, if you want me to Make you good when you are bad I'm not a human, I'm a dove I'm your conscience, 